Hello, my name is Joseph Espinoza, and today we are talking about cyclic subspaces. Uh, this topic can be found in section 5.4 of the textbook. Before we begin, we should talk about some notation. So when we see t to the 2 of x, this is just t composed with t of x. Likewise, if we see t to the n, this is just t composed with itself n minus 1 times. Now that that's out of the way, we can talk about t cyclic subspaces. If we let t be a linear operator defined on a vector space v, and let x be a non-zero vector in that vector space v, then the t cyclic subspace of v generated by x is the subspace w equal to the span of the set of vectors x, t of x, t2 of x, and so on. Since w is a subspace of v, then it's possible that w is v. In this case, we call x a cyclic vector. A key property of cyclic subspaces is that they are t-invariant subspaces of v. In particular, they are actually the smallest t-invariant subspace of v containing x. So if we come across a subspace u that is also a t-invariant subspace of v, and it happens to contain x, then we know that it also has to contain w as well. Some theoretical applications of t-cyclic subspaces include uh, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, um, determining characteristic polynomials without the need of determinants, and they show up later on in Chapter 7 of with rational canonical form. We should look at an example, and this one is one that we've seen throughout the semester. If we consider the space of polynomials with real coefficients, and we let t be a linear operator on this space such that t is the derivative, then the t cyclic subspace of v generated by the polynomial x to the power of n is just a space w equal to the span of the set of vectors x to the power of n, and then these are just the consecutive derivatives of this polynomial until we get to a constant value, at which point the derivative becomes zero, and we don't need that to span our set, right? It's because it's a zero vector. This should be familiar because this is just the basis for this set. So if we take the span of it, it just is this set, right? This set is the space of polynomials, but up to degree n with real coefficients. So this set that we've seen all semester long is actually a t subspace of the whole space. Now that we've seen an example, we should look at some counterexamples. If we have some finite dimensional vector space v, and we take some linear operator t on this vector space v, and we have two t cyclic subspaces that are equal to each other, do they necessarily have the same generating vector? We can see this is not the case if we consider the vector space v to be just the real numbers, which are of dimension 1, and we let our linear operator just be the identity map. Then we can just take vectors v equal 1, and w equal minus 1, and consider their spans. These spans are just the real numbers, so the spaces are equal, but the generating vectors are not. Now consider another finite dimensional vector space v, and let t be a linear operator on this vector space. Then for any vector v and the vector t of v, Will these two vectors generate the same t cyclic subspace? We can see this is not the case if we consider v to be r2, or the two-dimensional real numbers. And if we let t of x, y just be y0, then if we take the vector 0, 1 and t of 0, 1, and let them be w and t of w, respectively, and define w and w prime to be the t cyclic subspaces generated by these two vectors, then we see that w is the span of the vector 0, 1, and 1, 0, but w prime is the span of just 1, 0. So these two spaces are not equal. Now we should look at a theorem about t cyclic subspaces. This theorem is theorem 5.21a or 22a, depending on what edition of the textbook you have, fourth or fifth. And it says that if we let t be a linear operator on a finite dimensional vector space v, and let the space w be the t cyclic subspace of v generated by a non-zero vector v, 
and if we let the dimension of w be equal to k, then we get that the set of vectors v, t of v, t2 of v, and so on until we get to tk minus 1 of v is a basis for w. If you're curious, there is a b part to this theorem, but it's related to characteristic polynomials, and that's something that we'll probably have to watch another video for. Now we can take a look at some interesting stuff. Let's take a look at an example. This one is 5.4.26. Let t be a linear operator on an n-dimensional vector space v, such that t has n distinct eigenvalues. Prove that v is a t-cyclic subspace of itself. And they give us a little hint, and it says to use exercise 5.4.23 to find a vector v such that this set of vectors is linearly independent. And this set of vectors looks a lot like this set of vectors. So theorem 5.21a is going to be a good thing to use here. Some other results and theorems that we should use is exercise 5.4.23, which is the one it told us to use. And it says to let t be a linear operator on a finite dimensional vector space v, and let w be a t invariant subspace of v. Suppose that v1 through vk are eigenvectors of t corresponding to distinct eigenvalues. Then if the sum of these eigenvectors are in w, then each of them is in w. Theorem 5.5 will also be helpful. The fifth edition version is seen here. The fourth edition version is not necessarily equivalent. This one is more general. Let t be a linear operator on a vector space and let lambda 1 through lambda k be distinct eigenvalues of t. For each i 1 through k, let the set s sub i be a finite set of eigenvectors of t corresponding to lambda sub i. If each s sub i is linearly independent, then the union of them is linearly independent. Now we are ready to tackle this exercise. Again, it says let t be a linear operator on an n-dimensional vector space v such that t has n distinct eigenvalues. We want to show that the space v is actually a t-cyclic subspace of itself. So let's begin the proof by noting that we are given that t has n distinct eigenvalues. So we can take corresponding eigenvectors v sub i and consider the vector that is just the sum of these eigenvectors. Then we want to let w be the t-cyclic subspace of v generated by the vector v so that the space w is t invariant, so we can use our theorem. Then by exercise 5.4.23, since the vector v equal to the sum of these eigenvectors is in w, then each of these eigenvectors are also in w. And theorem 5.5 provides us with the result that a finite set, a union of finite sets of eigenvectors that is linearly independent is also linearly independent. So then we know that the dimension of w, which is made up of the span of at least these vectors, is at least n. But since w is a subspace of v, it has to have dimension at most n. So the dimension of w must just be n. So then our space w is actually just the whole space v itself. And we have that by our theorem that this set of vectors v, t of v, all the way up to tn minus 1 of v, is just a basis for w and since w is equal to v it's also have to it also has to be a basis for v as well so we've shown that v is actually a t cyclic subspace of itself thank you for watching i hope this was helpful i look forward to watching everyone else's videos and i want to wish everyone else good luck on the exam